focused on him all the time. And I, somebody posted something. I'm, I'm just going to read one verse out of 1 Timothy 6.10. Then I'll be in Matthew, the 6th chapter, and the 23rd chapter of Matthew. But they said money is the root of all evil. Money's not the root of all evil. But it says here, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred in the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When money starts to become your first thing, you're going to have a problem. Amen. You better be focused on the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you're not focused on the Lord, you're going to worry about everything there is. But if you go over to Matthew, the sixth chapter, and we'll go down about the 33rd and 34th verse. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto day is the evil thereof. You've got enough problems to put on today. You need to not be worrying about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Yes, it will be. And if you're following the Lord, He'll give you a peace. And I took care of mom and dad. Many nights I'd lay in bed. I did not know what I was going to do about tomorrow. Problems coming up, decisions we'd have to make. But I'd talk to my father. And I'd spend time in prayer. And I would take time and sleep like a Christian. They say sleep like a baby. No, I say sleep like a Christian. Because if you're truly walking with the Lord, you're going to have peace. You're not going to have turmoil in your mind. And if you get the turmoil gone from your mind, then you can get a good night's sleep. Wake up in the morning facing the problem that was still there. But I had a clear mind and I was ready to face it because the Lord was going to take care of it. And when he took care of it, it is taken care of. And I'll, I hadn't thought of it, but um, Dad was a, my mother was a social worker we had. Let's just say um, she wasn't a nice person. And she informed me. We couldn't get Dad's mood swings to stabilize. And she informed me my dad would go to a nursing home that I don't have a choice. I said, yes, my brother and sister and I will decide what is best for my father. Amen, brother. You don't have that choice. That's and right. while you're at it, your mother needs to be a care of professionals can properly take care of her. My mom was about seven and a half years in Alzheimer's. And I had my hands in my lap and I looked at her kind of sheepish and I said, excuse me, I've been taking care of mommy and daddy for six months. Mommy's memory and motor skills have come back 30%. What am I doing wrong? Oh, they have? I, exactly. You know nothing about me or my family, but you know what's best? No, I don't believe you do. Well, in the morning, they're going to kick my dad in the nursing home. I went home and I cried like a baby. But I talked to the Lord. I said, I can't change your heart and mind. You change it or you move her out of the way, and I don't care which. Went down the next morning, had a different social worker. Her name was Joy. And I said, what happened to the other lady? She said, we don't know. She called in and said she needed a two-week leave of absence. When we asked her what was going on, she screamed at the top of her lungs, said, I can't talk about it, slammed the phone down. <laughs> so I know where that came from. Thank you, Lord. Appreciate it. Amen. She laid out if we brought Dad home what we need versus nursing home. She had about four pages she wrote up. Told us everything we needed. God will provide everything you need if you're working with Him and trusting Him. Yes, amen. And ultimately, Dad had to go to a nursing home. But she brought things up we would have never thought of. You see, the Lord will provide everything you need. And that if you go down to the Matthew, well, you're seeking the first kingdom of God. But go over to the 23rd chapter of Matthew. We'll start at the 
first verse and go down a little ways and then we'll jump towards the end. But what I have found when you're working with the Lord and you're right where you need to be. The churches, I've been in some churches, mom and dad's church we grew up in. It was a big Lutheran church. It was a pretty church. And when I got saved, it was Black Holiness Church. Sanctuary was built onto the house. And people said, why would you go to a dump like that when you've got that big, beautiful church down there? You can come into the most beautiful church, the most ornate church in the world, and it can be deader than 4 a.m., yeah. and there's no spirit. Nothing. But you walk in through this door, I'll go Sunday night, I'll say the same thing, whether he's here or not. I have always felt the Lord there. Praise God. And that's, yeah. nobody can even be there, but I feel it because there's a prayer, a reverence, Amen. and an anointing that will be there when a church is right. But you go, oh yeah, but the church is beautiful. Well, yeah, on the outside can be beautiful. What's on the inside? Come on, brother. Amen. That's right. We got to start looking from our heart, Amen. Amen. not the natural life. And when we do that, and people say I'm a clothesline preacher, no, I'm not. But I look to see what you've got on when you come to church. And I've never seen you without your robe of righteousness. And that's what I want to say. Amen. Same Amen. thing with Brother Grover. You know where I go to church. That's one thing I look for. Amen. Do I see the anointing of the Lord on me? And if I do, and I went to church one night and Pastor was very strongly anointed, and I did not see it on him that night. And I thought, what's going on? He wasn't called Fritch that night. He thought he was scheduled, but the Lord scheduled somebody else. That person had the anointing. When the anointing is there, it will be. But we'll read down a little bit. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, and all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. How many people are preaching and telling you to do things, but they're not doing it? They're not living it. Well, if they're not living it, it's not real. Said about Pastor Wilkes in Alabama, he'd come up for a five night watch every year at our church. And they said, there ain't no way he lives it. I've been in his house, trust me. He preached it hard, but he lived it that way. And they said, you really believe that? I said, yeah, I've been in his house. And the peace they had in that house, raised eight kids on olive oil and Bible. He said, we couldn't afford a doctor. But he said, it works. And when I was down to her house, I had a refrigerator there, and you could still see the oil marks on the top. One of the kids left the freezer door open, and they got home from church. Everything was melted, ice, ice cream, milk, everything ruined. Freezer had burned up. And he said, you could smell it. They cleaned the mess up. He said, I got my hand out with the oil, slapped it on, and rubbed over it, and said, Lord, we didn't mean this to happen. And when you got means to get a refrigerator, and I'm expecting it in the morning, it's going to be fine. He's filling up the ice cube trays. His wife said, What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to have ice water in the morning. <laughs> he woke up in the morning, had his ice water. And 23 years later, it was still working. Praise God. <laughs> now, we can pray and have faith. And we can believe. But then are we acting on what we're believing? Right. When he says you're healed, then do you go ahead and just believe you're healed? Amen. Or do you, well, I ain't seen it yet. My left fingers don't work quite how they should yet, but they're going to. Come on, brother. And I'm not backing down from that. People say, well, yeah, it's been three years. It's been a little over three years. Doesn't matter. Rome wasn't built in a day. Come Your on. healing's not, healing is a process. It is not something that's going to happen instant. That's a miracle. Amen. I'm going to walk in the blessings of God and his healings. Yeah, and if yes. I do Hallelujah. that, then my mind's going to get focused on him and not the situation. And that's what we need to. But they preach a lot of things. But are they living it? Are we seeing it real in their lives? And the pastor got saved <laughs> under 
He'd be stretched out on the floor reading the Bible when you come to the house. Rarely ever wasn't he reading the Bible. <coughs> and he'd pray every day, give me one more nugget, Lord. I'd like one more little revelation. Are we seeking for another revelation from the Lord? And if we would do that, would we maybe not pray for Pastor Maggard, Pastor Grover? Maybe if we'd start praying for him every day, we'd have better services. Because you're about to get focused on, hey, Wednesday nights come up, I want to see something happen tonight. Yes, and then you get here, you're going to be excited. Well, maybe we should be excited. Because if you're preaching to numbers and you don't have many come out, you're going to get disappointed. Yep. But you take what you have and you go with it. Yes. Yeah. You may not like it, on, but you go with it. That's right. Right. Because God will provide who's supposed to be there. And the ones that should have been didn't come. They lost out. Amen. Right. But we'll read a few verses down before we jump over. And fifth verse. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Then they broad their parlastrics, enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at the feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren, and all call no man to your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Amen. They want the best seats. They want to be seen of men. Come on, brother. Well, if you're putting on a show, you ain't right with God. Amen. You need Amen. to be humble before Amen. the Lord. And my pastor, where I got saved, they'd all, oh, you got to sit up with the pastors. He'd always sit in the back. He said, I'd rather they call me up front than to me go up front and have to move to the back. Well, that's in the Bible. And I, I thought about an evangelist they called to preach one Sunday at a church. And they spoke, or I mean, he was an anointed evangelist. And when he walked up, man, that brother was strutting the stuff. Because, man, he had it. <laughs> He got up there, the Lord dumped his mouth, and he couldn't speak. Oh, and he walked down with his head in shame because he couldn't preach. He went up in himself, right. glorying in what he could do. Instead of what the Lord will do through him. And that's what's important. You know, thank you all for a good message, but they always, you know, it was the Lord. And it was the Lord, and I know that, but I'm giving honor to the vessel that he used. But if we get arrogant <coughs> or we want to be seen of men, yeah. Amen. I've been told I shouldn't wear a tie. I'm getting worldly and too, too flashy. <laughs> but then I've also been told you need to have a tie to preach. No, you need to have the Holy Ghost inside yeah, of you to yeah, preach. Yeah, it ain't about your shirt or your clothes. On, if you got the Holy Ghost inside of you, then you can do something. Right. Because then yeah. you'll allow Him to speak through you. Yes. So it's not about how you're dressed. And, you know, they, a lot of times they get to talk about the women, how they dress. But we ought to talk about the men too, because some of them don't dress appropriate either. Come on, brother. <laughs> but I stopped for a pizza one night. And there are two ladies, they had real long jean dresses on. They had their hair up in PhD. And they looked like the perfect picture of a Pentecostal woman. <laughs> and I thought, well, they must have just come from a revival or something. So they spoke. I got about 10 feet away, and I plainly understood I wasn't going to talk to those women. <laughs> their language was horrible. And they was talking about things nobody should be talking about. Come on, brother. You look at the outside Amen. and you see what you think. But you've got to be looking to the inside. Yes, Pay attention to what they're saying. And if we would start doing that, <coughs> and I'm not saying when you see somebody's wrong, go up and confront them. But talk to the Lord. How do I approach this? How do I deal with it? Sometimes your silence will hurt them more than if you said anything. Because the conviction that will come on them without, and I'm not bragging on me, but I'm bragging on the Lord when it's on you. And years back, I won't share all of it, but I was asked not to say anything about 
them drinking and alcohol, I said, I won't say a word. They said, please don't. I said, I'll let the Lord speak. He did. <laughs> I never said a word, and the more I blew it off, the guiltier they got. And it got rather funny because if you're walking right with the Lord, they will know that. Right. And you don't have to show it. You don't have to have Christian t-shirts. There's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> But if they can't see the righteousness of God in you right. without all that, because it's not about what you're wearing, it's about what you have inside. Yes. 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 Where I got yes. truck company I drove for for nine years or so, Harlan Wiggington, a sweet man of God. Never, ever heard him speak ill of anybody. And he would carefully choose his words so he didn't. And I talked to him all the time about the Lord. I wasn't saved. Well, I quit to take care of mom, dad, and about a year later, I went back. I got saved, and and I I went back to terminal and got talking to Wiggy, and he got the cutest grin. He said, "You done what? Got yourself saved, didn't you?" I said, "Yeah, I did. Why would you say that? I always suspicioned you knew of him, but now you know him for real." Amen. There is a change that will be made when you come up from that altar. And when that change happens, praise God for that change. Because people will see the difference in you. And my ex fiance she said after her mom passed, she thought about going out to church where I got saved. But she was raised Catholic and one thing and another. But um, one of my friends said, if there was that drastic a change in somebody, I'd want to go find out what's going on in that church. Amen. But some people, they won't go. They won't find out. They'll have religion, but they won't have relationship. Right. And we're going to jump over to the last part. Um, start around the 23rd verse. It said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of men, and arise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ye ought to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind, ye blind guides, which stain and strain at a net, and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. And how many times have they clean up and they look nice, but they haven't cleaned up inside. We need to clean up. And we need to talk to our kids and our grandkids. Let them know there's a heaven to gain, a hell to shun. And if we don't, and... My ex fiance when her family gets together, there was a book written, Divine Revelation of Hell. And she said the Lord took her in the spirit 40 days or 40 nights into the depths of hell. And it's, it's a horrible book. I mean, the things in it. And people said they didn't believe it was real. Real or not, it did line up with the Bible. But if it gets you to line up with the Word, it's good. Yeah. Well, I had it laid out at her mom's house, and they had some of their grandkids, it was grade school, you know, maybe four year old, six, eight, ten, whatever. I got jumped on, they said, they don't need that book out there. You need to get that thing hit. I said, why do they need, they don't need to know about hell. Yes, they do. Yes. We need to teach our kids yes, and amen. our grandkids, our great grandkids. We amen. need to let them know about it. There's we that. need to preach to them that way. And they say, yeah, but it's going to scare them. Well, maybe it'll scare them straight to where they'll get right. It'll put a conviction on them. I remember growing up, we never had those kind of messages in the church I was raised in. And nothing against the Lutheran church. It's just, it's a different way. But then after I got saved, I started hearing messages about hell and damnation and the blood. And I realized we need to preach that. Yep, right. We've got to start preaching that more and more. And when our hearts get cleaned up, then we will preach the true word of God. Yes, amen. 
But if our hearts aren't clean, can you really preach the truth? When you're in the middle of being a drunk, how can you preach against alcohol? It's going to be hard to do that. Elder Taylor said when they was 17, 18 years old, and he said there were, I forget how many kids, there were a lot of kids in their family. And when his daddy was getting close to his deathbed, he called him in out of all the kids. He said, if you ever want to see me again, you better get right with the Lord. He said, boy, that hurt me more than anything. Yes, I mean, but he said they was outside and there was an evangelist preached and first three nights he preached pretty good. Well, Thursday night he come out and they all had some corn liquor was drinking it. He said, hey, where'd you guys get that? He said, I always like a little taste. Gets my tongue loose where I can preach better. <laughs> he said, oh, he preached real good that night. Not really, but he thought he did. If you got to have something besides the Holy Ghost, then you can't hey, preach right. Hey, come on, brother. You've got to have that in your life. And if you Man. do, yeah. you're going to preach right. right. But if you don't have that in your life, you better get it. And you better stay after it. Because the devil will come. That's right, brother. And he will try to take away or say, well, you shouldn't preach that. My pastor, Grover, came tonight. Thank God he came. And the minute he walked in, the devil said, you better watch what you preach. <coughs> Why? I'm just going to preach the gospel. <laughs> Amen, I'm going to preach the gospel. But he'll put any thought he can in your head to try to disturb Praise you. God. And then people testify in that. You can build on those, but you can't let it. When he gives you something, <coughs> that's what you need to preach. Amen. And I thank the Lord for it. And I'll read a couple verses here and then we're going to. Bless of Jesus. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited spectulars, which indeed appear beautiful on the outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. We're going to close on that one, but just because it looks good doesn't on, mean that it is. That's right. Amen. I, I was invited years back. I was renovating a building, and the brother uh, was helping me, Brother Martin. He was 70 years old. He did some brick work for me. And he said they were wanting to have a revival at their church, but he said, we got to build an altar. I said, Lord, if that's all keeping you from revival, I'll shut the building down a couple days and I'll go help you build one. His little church behind the Miracle Lane used to be up in Dayton. And if you saw pictures of houses of Hurricane Katrina, would have made this place look clean. This place would have looked clean compared to them. They had wires hanging down in the back. It was a house. They built a sanctuary in the front. But when you walked in, there was an anointing in that building that was priceless. And we we took three days. We built an altar. And we went down and got materials. We went down at Miami Hardware. And their aisles are real close together. And he and I got to singing about the blood, eating our lunch. And we <coughs> went in there still singing about the blood. We never lacked space to get in any place there. Nobody wanted to be near us. And we got the altar built, and I went for a couple nights of revival. And the pastor was an elderly lady, and that girl was anointed, and she could God. preach the word. And I'm glad that I took time and did that. But had you looked at the building itself, you'd say, Good Lord, why would you want to go here to church? Because Jesus is there. Amen. And I want to go where he is. Yes. And if he ain't there, do I want to be there? I'm not sure. Unless he sends me, because then Jesus will be there. Right. So are you walking with the Lord? Is he inside him and his father? They said they'd take their abode up. And if they took their abode, then wherever you go, Jesus is there. Right. And if he's there, let your light shine bright, that all the world can see the joy of serving Jesus Amen. with his smile.